let me tell you, we had the tissues out here. It was so, so beautiful. But you know what I do think we were ripped off at? Yeah. Where was the kiss? Where was the follow-up kiss? Yes, we did. We're not a fan of the kiss. Not we wanted. Happy. We thought we'd get. It'd be a little bit more, more amorous. We thought we'd get. You know, a bit of a pash. We yeah. say. And it wasn't much better than Will's and Kate's kiss. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And the battle of the royal waffle saw no topic go untouched as Nine, Seven, the ABC, and SBS went head to head on Saturday night. But when it came to the ratings, there was only one clear winner. And we are the only Australian broadcaster with a studio on the grounds of Windsor Castle and what a front seat to history it will be. Yep, Channel 7, which sent 30 people to London to drive its coverage and had nine royal experts to help on the night, easily won with just under two million watching. And when the bride and groom rolled past the Seven studio, Mel Doyle was out of her seat with excitement. Here we go. Sorry, I jumped out of my chair. I don't Mel, want to give them away. You, you can yeah, see yeah, them yeah. first, I think, can't no, you? No, I can. They're coming up. Yeah. Slowing down a little at this point, yes. too, which is fantastic as well. So. And look at, look at all the cameras in the air. Yes. Including an eager producer's camera here in the bottom left corner of the screen. The ABC was also there amid the media throng on Saturday with Annabel Crabbe and Jeremy Fernandez offering us not quite ringside seats. You're watching the ABC's coverage of the wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle about to take place here at Windsor Castle. We are in something of a holding pen with the rest of the 5,000 media professionals who've descended on this tiny town. In fact, we are just next to the Danish broadcasters, so if you get a bit of a Borgen vibe from our broadcast, it's not your imagination. Back home, news that Crabbe and Fernandez would be leading this coverage had incensed some coalition politicians and ABC critics, with News Corp's Daily Telegraph taking the lead in branding their trip a shocking waste of taxpayers' money. ABCs of piling on telecast expense. Two of the ABC's star presenters jetted into London yesterday on taxpayer-funded business-class flights to cover the royal wedding. Jetted, eh? Yes, seems propellers are out of fashion. And did they really fly business? Well, no, as the ABC soon made clear. The ABC paid for employees travelling to London to cover the royal wedding to travel economy. The ABC has asked for a retraction. It didn't get one, of course, or any hint of an apology. Initially just adding a denial to the online story, in which, by some strange logic, the telly's error was transformed into a, quote, sudden backtrack by the public broadcaster. Never mind that the telly's editor-at-large, Matthew Benz, didn't confirm whether the business class claim was true or, heaven forbid, get in touch with Annabel Crabb, who soon tweeted... Mate, you could have checked that yarn with me in about two minutes. For the record, I flew Thai Airways in seat 52G, spooned against a very large stranger, then went straight into full day's work. Benz had also failed to spot this photo on Instagram from Heathrow Airport of Jeremy Fernandez making friends in economy class. Even though Benz had pinched the photo next door to castigate the two reporters for taking a selfie outside the palace. But why let the facts get in the way of good old-fashioned prejudice? And we ask that because the telly is again being caught red-handed by the Australian Press Council, misleading its readers. Remember this story on Media Watch last year? A new history war has erupted over the statue of Captain Cook in Hyde Park. The inscription says he discovered this territory. And with the rise of the anti-Australia Day movement, Indigenous leaders are now voicing their anger. That was last August when ABC journalist Stan Grant sparked a national debate by highlighting US protests against statues of pro-slavery leaders and questioning whether it could also happen here. Grant said while many Indigenous people might prefer to see Captain Cook torn down, he was not advocating it. But the telly typically took a less nuanced line. Aussie Taliban. PC vandals bid to tear down our history. That, we said at the time, was nothing more than a monumental beat-up. And last week, the Australian Press Council agreed. There is nothing in the article that could reasonably justify the statements in question, especially the reference to a groundswell of PC activists. According to the Press Council, the Telegraph's article was both inaccurate and lacking fairness and balance. But while the paper did publish the wordy adjudication last Thursday, it then countered with an editorial of its own. The Press Council want the telly to give history a PC twist. The Daily Telegraph reported, in our own robust way, the reaction to this debate. We question decisions with a politically correct overtone, a tut-tutting about how stories are presented. 
Tut, tut, indeed. If the paper sounds a little sensitive to criticism, maybe it's because the Press Council so often finds its coverage out of bounds. Last week's verdict was the third adverse finding against the telly in a matter of months. Only two weeks ago, the Sunday Telegraph was stung for this story from July last year. Mum died from her toddler's sickness. The unequivocal headline that Gold Coast mother Imogen Petrak died after contracting pneumococcal from her unvaccinated son was without factual basis. And the watchdog found the telly's story breached six of the eight principles of decent journalism in that it was inaccurate, unfair, intrusive, unjustifiably distressing and had failed to offer remedial action or publish a response. So, what punishment did the journalist, editors or parent company News Corp face for such journalistic errors? Why, none, of course. Except the requirement nine months later to publish the regulator's legalistic thousand-word judgement somewhere in the paper. The telly was also pinged by the press council in March for this misleading story written a year before. Triggs' gig for Greens. Australia's Human Rights Commission chief, Gillian Triggs, is under pressure to step down after agreeing to headline a fundraiser for ex-Greens leader Bob Brown. That said the press council was misleading because the event was not a fundraiser. And not for the Greens. It was a speech for Bob Brown's charitable foundation. So, was News Corp sorry then? Not a chance. Telegraph columnist Miranda Devine called it a, quote, really unfortunate decision while the Australian's associate editor, Chris Kenny, teed off on Twitter. Press council is a joke. Media is overrun by prancing virtue signallers, leftist activists and chippy people desperate to prove they are superior to the people they serve. Or, indeed, by an unrepentant media group that's convinced it's superior to the regulator. And that is the problem. The press council has very little respect among the journalists and publishers it's supposed to hold accountable. And in the system of voluntary regulation, it has no power to punish the organisations that fund it. So it's possible for The Telegraph and its supporters to just laugh at its decisions. But now to the recent mass shooting near Margaret River and debate about how the media should report it. Good evening. A quiet West Australian community is struggling to come to terms with a massacre that left seven family members dead. Three guns found on the property belong to the grandfather, who is believed to have shot his wife, daughter and four grandchildren before killing himself. Police believe that after killing those six members of his family, 61-year-old Peter Miles made a call to Triple O and then turned the gun on himself. And in the aftermath of the tragedy, where depression may or may not have been a trigger, reporting rightly focused on who Miles was and why he would commit such a horror. The Seven's Robert Avadia reported from Margaret River. Many here simply refuse to believe a loving grandfather could be so brutal. And this story in last week's Sunday Telegraph took that theme a little further. Grandad the killer, good bloke, shot wife, daughter and her four kids, then himself. At that angle on the killings, the worst mass shooting since Port Arthur, left some journalists and commentators angry. Good blokes don't murder their families, full stop. Peter Miles wasn't a good bloke. Slaughtering your whole family has to be where we draw the line at being honoured with that title. The good bloke descriptor in domestic murder cases is so automatic, the headline writer used it even though nobody in the story actually described him that way. But Avadia, who was in WA to cover the story, was quick to defend the reporting. I can tell you this was the universal opinion of literally everybody we spoke with in the Margaret River Township who knew Miles before his rampage, men and women. So, how common is this theme of the good guy who snaps? Well, you don't have to look far to find examples. Jeff Hunt, who murdered his wife and three children in the New South Wales Riverina in 2014, was described at the time as a, quote, good man by The Australian and also by the Sydney Morning Herald, which reported... You couldn't get a better bloke, the most gentle, considerate bloke, a pillar of society. In 2016, the ABC published almost identical comments about Damien Little, a Port Lincoln father who shot his two sons before driving them and himself off a wharf. Mr Little was respected and well-liked. You couldn't have asked for a better bloke. So, this isn't the first time it's happened or the first time the debate has raged. But, as Robert Avadia asks, what's wrong with reporting that family and friends thought Peter Miles was a good bloke before he committed this heinous crime? Nobody thinks he's a good bloke after the fact. Surely that's implicit. Surely. 
Why should we be afraid to report what people thought of him before? It's accurate. Well, some domestic violence experts say that looking at the perpetrators through that lens misrepresents the nature of their crime. Phil Cleary, an ex-Victorian politician whose sister was murdered by her partner, says of murder-suicides like these... It is a disgraceful act that we should condemn, driven by a view of women and children as commodities to be controlled by a man. And a similar mindset, according to the New South Wales coroner, is what caused Jeff Hunt to kill his wife and children in 2014. Because of his essential self-image of his position as the head of a family that he believed was dependent upon him, his distorted logic led him to conclude that the children and his wife would not cope without him. He then set about systemically and cold-bloodedly killing each of them before killing himself. The coroner investigating the deaths of the Hunt family called it... The absolute worst of crimes. The CEO of Domestic Violence Victoria, Fiona McCormack, says the media need to bear findings like that in mind when they shape their reporting. Telling Media Watch... If a stranger had walked onto that property and killed two women and four children, no one would be talking about his heartbreak. He'd be a mass murderer and a monster. Men who kill their families usually have friends and families who loved them, but providing quotes from those people without any context explaining the underlying sense of entitlement that makes these men think they have the right to take the lives of women in their family is one-sided and misleading. So, how should journalists be reporting them? Well, perhaps with a little more context and understanding of the nature of these crimes. Margaret Simons, a Walkley Award-winning journalist and academic, told MediaWatch... We know from good and authoritative research that homicidal instances of family violence nearly always are the awful climax to a previous history of abuse and or violence. And she adds... The nature of family violence is that it is hidden. Friends, neighbours and colleagues therefore do not necessarily know about it and their testimony is of limited use and meaning. In other words, the fact that everyone thought the killer was a good bloke doesn't necessarily mean that he was at least not to his family. So, proceed with caution. And finally, to the courts and an Alice in Wonderland world where the media is not allowed to report anything at all about an upcoming trial. Which trial? I'm afraid I can't tell you, although you might well know because it has been in the news. So, uh, what state's it in? Not sure we should take that risk. So, is there a blanket ban on the media reporting it? Or what's commonly known as a super injunction? Well, if there were, we wouldn't be able to tell you that either. And we certainly wouldn't be able to tell you why a court might have granted it. Crazy? You bet. In contempt of the principle of open justice, that too. So why all the secrecy? Well, in general, super injunctions are sought to ensure the accused can get a fair trial. And we have no problem with that. But when the courts tell the media and the public they're not allowed to know when a total media blackout has been ordered, let alone the reason for it, we have reached the height of absurdity. I may even have gone too far by telling you this. So, if the next Media Watch is broadcast from jail, you'll know why. And there's more about tonight's stories on our Facebook page or our website, where you can get a transcript and download the programme. You can also catch up with us on iView and contact me or Media Watch on Twitter. And don't forget, Media Bites every Thursday. But for now, until next week, that's it from us. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>